January 6, 1982, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I broke into a chamber beneath the Calvary Escarpment, north of the city wall of Jerusalem. In that chamber is the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, and several other things that I didn't see. They were covered with animal skins, with boards, and then with stones. We had excavated down that escarpment. We had found three cutouts in the wall, like a recessed bookcase. We know from the valley north of Jerusalem that the ancient kings and rulers cut these things out in cliffs near uh, populous areas or where a lot of people would be going by, and they put plaques of stone and whatever else in there bearing messages. We found the cutouts. We found the cross hole. If you read in the book of Matthew and the Gospels where it talks about Christ's death, it says the earth shook violently and the rocks were rent. Right to the left of the cross hole at the base of where Christ died on the cross, the rock was rent. After Christ died and the centurion stuck his spear, spear into Christ's spleen and the blood and water came out. It went down through that crack. It went on to the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant that God had arranged to be hidden in that chamber 600 years before Christ died. Now, what is the significance of this? Psalm 77, 13 says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. On the Day of Atonement, the goat that represented Christ as the sin bearer, after all of the sins were figuratively transferred to its head, was killed. Its blood was taken into the most holy place and sprinkled on the mercy seat. Those folks looked forward to the fact that Christ would die. They confessed their sins on the head of lambs and took the lives of these innocent little animals. We by faith believe that Christ has indeed died and we in praying to God in Christ's name receive forgiveness of our sins by faith in that fact. The reason I dug in that particular place was an unusual thing that happened to me. I was walking by there and my sons and I had gone to Israel to get chariot parts out of the Red Sea. Due to my own ignorance and carelessness, I got sunburns bad, my feet and legs swelled up, I couldn't get in the diving gear. So we were up hobbling around Jerusalem, waiting for the date that was on our ticket. We got one of those cheap tickets, that, you know, that you can only fly on the proper date. I was walking along and my left hand just went out like that and my mouth said, that's Jeremiah's brother when the heart of the covenant's been there. Well, I didn't uh, do that. Deliberately it happened without my mental uh, intent to do so. And I knew that some supernatural power had used my arm and my voice. I wasn't sure which. So I went back home and started checking to see why the Ark of the Covenant might be there. And the research indicated that it quite likely wouldn't be there. The Ark of the Covenant most likely was carried out of the temple and hidden in this chamber during the 28 days between the time Zedekiah fled the city and the occasion when the Babylonian army came and destroyed the city, the temple and the palaces and all that. At that point in time, many people were probably being buried. I wasn't there, I don't know, but it seemed like that would be an opportunity to do that. Now, if the priest just took the Ark of the Covenant and started carrying it out and into a cave, the Babylonian army would get a glimpse of it. The Jewish people in the, in the city would have got a glimpse, and there would have been a real hubbub, you know what I mean? So it appears they put it in this thin wall stone box to make it appear that it was just another barrier. <laughs> now, when I found the Ark of the Covenant, the lid on the stone box had been busted and slid around, one end of it slid around to the side, and there was dried blood on both edges of that broken lid. 
And of course, later when I had access to the mercy seat itself, it was large quantities of dry blood and ceremony. Normally, crucifixions didn't involve a whole lot of blood. However, it is stated that they wanted to make sure Christ was dead, so they stuck a spear in And the blood and water gushed out. So this was a bloody one. It's not ordinary blood, folks. It has 24 chromosomes only. All of us here have 46. Unless you know we have, there's a couple of genetic uh, anomalies that make that different. But Christ received 23 from his mother and one Y, sex determining factor from his father who was not a human father because had he received that from a human father it would have been accompanied by 22 autosomes now what this basically means is that his height his eye color his hair color and all of this was supplied from the genes of his mother's gene pool however mary and joseph both descended from David, uh, but none of us have 24 chromosomes. And there's a, something else. The Bible says, you will not leave my soul in hell, nor allow my body to see corruption. The blood of Christ is only cried out, folks, it's not dead. When we rehydrated it with normal saline, 72 hours of body temperature with slight, very gentle swirling and put the white blood cells in a growth medium. 48 hours later, we did a chromosome here. I didn't, I have people who are experts at that sort of thing to do these things for me. They asked me, where did you get this blood? Whose blood is this? This was in Israel. I said, it's the blood of your Messiah. I never saw people go into such a state of shock and fits and everything else as those people went into. I said, that's the blood of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> well, they knew. They told me before I asked them to, when I asked them to perform this investigation, that guy had dried blood and you can't get a chromosome count on it because the white blood cells have to be alive. What in order to do that? You can get DNA, you can get some other things, but you can't have a chromosome count. So this blood is unique and it is Christ's blood. When Christ was crucified, the Romans had picked a place north of the city wall where most everybody that came and went. They passed on their way to Jaffa, they passed here on their way to Damascus, on their way to Jericho, on their way to Anatoth, and all of these other places. They had to go along these, this road on the north side of the city because to the south, the east, and the west were big gullies. And you had to be pretty, you know, agile on your feet to go through those areas to get away from the city. So they chose this place for the crucifixion. And they cut out three recessed areas into the rock face that would hold signs stating who the person was that was being crucified and what his accusation was, what he had been accused of. Well, in Christ's case, he was Jesus of Nazareth. However, Pilate said the king of the Jews, and the Jews didn't like that. But he says, what I have written, I have written. North of the city wall of Jerusalem lies a beautiful garden right next to the crucifixion site. In that garden, less than 200 feet from the place that Jesus was crucified, is a tomb chiseled into the face of the cliff. Now we're going to go in. Here we can see inside of the tomb. So 
very old cross. And here we can see, and right back here, it was dug out more, presumably because Christ was taller to accommodate him. was out this door that Christ walked. He walked on this floor. The chamber where I found the Ark of the Covenant has since been perfectly cleaned out. And the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, the candlestick, the golden altar of incense, they are all set out as they were in the earthly temple, except that the Ark of the Covenant is set, setting against the 12 foot long and 18 foot wide or high wall. The tables of stone were found in the Ark of the Covenant. I personally removed them with the assistance of four angels who lived in the mercy seat, which I would estimate weighs about 900 pounds of solid gold. And one of these angels told me to take the tables of stone out of there. He said, God wants everyone to see those. And so I took them out, backed up, stood there, frozen in place. And I, well, I just can't describe my physical state or mental state or anything else. If, if you know, I didn't have some physical evidence to prove it happened, I think I had a dream or something. But anyway, they are now available to be shown. But we won't say, uh, actually, they're on the stone ledge right in the same chamber. That's where the angel put them after I handed them to him. I didn't want to do it. And uh, I was told that these are to be presented with the blood evidence when the mark of the beast law is passed or enforced. Now, I know everybody wonders about what it is, the mark of the beast. You've heard all kinds of rumors, stories, and all this. I'll tell you quick and simple. If you keep the Ten Commandments that God wrote upon those tables of stone, and about which he says in Psalms 89 and 34, those of you that are writing down text, you'll want this one. Psalms 89 and 34. He says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. He spoke the Ten Commandments from the mountaintop. He wrote them in stone. And he says, Nothing will change. Right? If you keep that law, you will receive the seal of God. Soon there will be a set of man made laws best intentions, surrounded by a barrage of salubrious soliloquies and sepulchral solicitudes. That's all kinds of stories and all of this, instigated by the devil to make you think that this is the best thing that ever happened to the human race and that you could just want to go along with it voluntarily. These man-made laws will require that you break God's Ten Commandments. Christ said to the Pharisees, For it is in vain that they who worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. If you keep those man-made laws and break God's Ten Commandments, you will receive the mark of the beast. Now, what I would like every man, woman, and child in this audience to remember, if you forget everything else, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, 
in full cooperation with his father, loved us to the point that they were willing to do that on our behalf. It's done, folks. We have been bought with the price. But it'll do us no good unless we go to the Father in the name and blood of his Son and ask for forgiveness and restoration to his likeness. Now, as you can see, I'm a fairly old man. There's been some experiences that I've encountered along the way, some helpful, some educational, some leaving scars behind and all of that. But one important lesson I've learned, when I first became aware of and had reason to believe that Christ had actually died for me and that eternal life was available on request, well, I made that request repeatedly. Lord, I want to be saved. I want to be in heaven. And I want my mom and dad to be there and my brothers and sisters and aunt so-and-so and grandma and all of this. I prayed those prayers. My life didn't change a bit. <clears throat> it was a mess. I did what Paul said he did. Something I knew that I shouldn't do, I ended up doing it things I wanted to do, good things, I never got around to it. I couldn't manage it somewhere or the other. So I asked the Lord to help me out of this horrible mess. And I was impressed to ask that he lay a burden for souls upon my heart that I could not resist. I started praying for that. He did it. And he loves everybody all over this earth. And if he wants me to go around and share his wonderful artifacts and words of life, and he'll help me do it, I'll keep at it. When I started praying that God would change me and do whatever was necessary in my life so that he could work in and through me, to help others come to him and be saved. Things started to change. That's what I recommend that you do, folks. That you ask the Father in the name and blood of his Son to come into your life through the power of his Holy Spirit, forgive you, cleanse you, help you quit sinning, and help you to reflect his character to the point that people will be drawn to him by your influence. When I get to heaven, I'm gonna look around and I wanna see every one of you there. You can make it with God's help. Christ is here tonight. He says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there in my midst. Please take advantage of that wonderful opportunity. <clears throat>